What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are picking back up again with Fall of X, and I'm really excited to see what you guys think about the ending of this video, because it's very exciting. It's very, very exciting. So, what this does is this picks up in the aftermath of what we had previously covered, which is to say, Sebastian Shaw, who was at one point, not really a member of the X-Men, but the mutant community, now that he's basically been cast out of the Hellfire Club, meaning he has no real influence of any kind, he's just a guy out there in the world trying to avoid capture by the human population that he's basically been putting together crews to try to plunder Krakoa, right? Because remember, all 250,000 mutants that were on Krakoa have basically been sent off the island. But Charles Xavier, the leader of the X-Men, is one of the only guys left. In fact, he's the only guy who's currently occupying the island. Previously, they'd sent in a group of mercenaries to try to plunder it. And then, of course, they came across Xavier and he helped them to understand their place in the bigger picture. In the follow-up to this, Celine steps in and then basically absorbs their essence, their memories, and then tells Sebastian Shaw what's going on. Now, Celine is one of the coolest mutants in Marvel Comics, who's kind of a mutant, but not really a mutant, sort of. It's one of those weird, finicky things, but you never really get to see her that much. And in fact, she really hasn't had a major role in Marvel since the X Necrotia storyline back in 2010. She has appeared and she's done some stuff, but she just hasn't really been on a grand stage. Celine is, by all standards of measurement, the oldest mutant to ever exist in the history of Marvel Comics. She's like 17,000 years old, and she's technically an external. So, for those of you guys who are familiar with this, bear with me here for a second. I want to explain this for people who are not. Externals are not to be confused with Eternals. Eternals are the result of just humans who, at one point in time, their genes were modified by Celestials, and they basically got like cosmic abilities and so on and so forth. Externals are mutants who are legitimately immortal. They're not indestructible. You can destroy their physical form. But when I say immortal, I mean to say they cannot age. They will never get sick, right? They will just live on forever so long as you don't find a way to decapitate them or something along those lines. Wolverine, for example, with his healing factor, you could argue he's an external, even though he's technically not. When it comes to Celine, she is an external, but she's not in the sense that she has to absorb other people's life energies in order to keep herself alive. But what she does when that happens is she absorbs their memories and everything that makes them who they are. With this happening, Sebastian Shaw realizes Xavier's still on the island and they can find a way around them. So what he ends up doing is basically sending in another group. This time they have mental blocks in place or devices that prevent Xavier from seemingly being able to influence their minds. We'll actually find out it doesn't work. But what we end up doing here before we get into that part is we switch over to Exodus. Now remember, Exodus is this just ridiculously powerful telepath and telekinetic in Marvel Comics. He's an Omega level mutant that's leading 250,000 mutants, those individuals who walked through the portals and seemingly disappeared off of all known planes of existence. He's leading them to what he calls paradise, but there is no actual destination. He's not really leading them anywhere in particular. He's just giving them hope until such a time that an opportunity presents itself that they can all effectively be rescued. But as a testament to this guy's level of power, what he realizes is that the longer they're in the desert, the more likely they are to succumb to the elements, which is to say the very harsh heat in the daytime, the very cold temperatures in the nighttime, the lack of water, the lack of food. And so what's been happening here is he's been basically using his telekinesis to pull water out of the air, right? And then in turn, deposit it into a location where people can basically drink. The other part of this is that mutants out there that have regenerative capabilities or simply just generative capabilities in and of themselves, meaning they can alter plant matter or they can kind of create something out of nothing, but not really. They're basically generating things that people can consume. For example, there's one mutant out there that can generate glucose, right? The very foundation of what you and I would call carbohydrates, if my knowledge of diet is correct, which is probably not because I'm in terrible shape. But the thing about this is that they basically find ways to kind of keep each other alive. But understand, not everyone is equipped for this, 
right? 250,000 mutants here. A majority of these guys have basic powers like wings that come out of their back and they can fly, right? Or like they can see at night or something along those lines. And while those powers are useful in certain situations, they're largely useless in this situation because the name of the game here is survival. And so what ends up happening is that Hope Summers, one of the only known members of the five capable of resurrecting mutants, in fact, the other four are basically missing, she asks Exodus how long he can keep this up because despite how powerful he is, he can't do this forever. Virtually every mutant out there needs to rest in some capacity somewhere along the line. But because the powers of Hope Summers is to copy the powers of the people around her, she can basically take its place. So they can literally just do shifts, right? They can just kind of take it in turns to create water or whatever resources are available that their powers can use in order to bring some measure of sustenance to people. But it's one of those interesting things because what you end up getting is basically a really kind of a minor mutant by the name of Kafka, who's kind of doing what is in effect patrol duty, right? Like they're all just taking it in shifts to keep an eye out in case there happen to be predators. Because remember, we don't know where they are and we don't know when they are. They can't be detected by Xavier, which means they're not currently on Earth. The idea here is that they seem to be in some other dimension that exists out there, but we don't really know what it is. The issue here is that as Kafka is doing his patrols, he comes across a variation of Wolverine that's attacking Mother Righteous. Now, you guys know how I feel about Mother Righteous. After reading the comments, you guys seem to love Mother Righteous. I don't fully understand why, <laughs> but hey, it is what it is. The funny thing here though, is that these do not seem to be the same versions of Wolverine that we've been seeing in the Wolverine solo series. Kind of a little side here, uh, that whole thing with like Beast and all that kind of stuff, that's basically taken a back seat to a degree while they went into Weapons of Vengeance. Once that story's done, we'll go back into the whole Beast, Wolverines, that storyline and all that kind of stuff, right? So just be aware that that's happening here for those of you guys who are curious. But of course, one of them immediately goes after Kafka, right? And in fact, actually chases him down as he gets over to Exodus and those guys. The question they have here is, where did these Wolverines come from? Here's a hint. It's not Mother Righteous. You would be inclined to believe that it is, right? She's very duplicitous. She's very manipulative, right? But it's not actually her. There's somebody out here in this desert that's sending these forces out there in order to test the entirety of the mutant population. That should give you a hint. If you cannot pick up that hint, I don't know what to tell you. I told you, the ending is dope. So what this does <laughs> is the mutants basically respond pretty readily. And in fact, it's Exodus who's the one that basically takes them out incredibly fast. And a lot of this is because of one, the nature of his powers, but two, they see him as a leader, right? The guy who is leading the entirety of the group. And that happens, right? It's one of the cool things about this story and the way that it's written. In times of desperation, people will believe what they want to believe. And in the absence of an ordered government, people will turn to warlords, petty strongmen, anybody who can grant them some measure of safety. And so Exodus provides them exactly that. It also helps that he was on the Quiet Council, right, the governing body of Krakoa before the entire fall of the mutant population. But it's one of those things where you have Mother Righteous who kind of shows up here and then basically reveals to everybody that she's a mutant. Now we've known this for a little while. We didn't necessarily know how far reaching it was if she actually had a mutant gene. She's a clone of a guy named Mr. Sinister. Sinister himself, was never a mutant in Marvel Comics. In fact, in the old stories, The Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix, he was just a human who had his genes modified by Apocalypse and became sinister. But there is a lot of changing going on here in Marvel Comics with regards to the traditional roles that various characters have. The idea behind Mother Righteous though, and what makes her really intriguing here, is that she never knew that she was actually a mutant. And in fact, it wasn't until Xavier was forced to use his telepathy to make all 200 150,000 mutants on Krakoa walk through the portals that she was able to successfully walk through one of the Krakoan gates and only mutants can do that. So that was kind of like the, okay, she's a mutant now, that's kind of wild. But the kicker about all this is we have to assume she's telling the truth. 
We don't know where she is. She's a very manipulative person and she lies in order to achieve her own ends. So we have no clue if she's actually telling the truth. But what's interesting is she talks about how for her, she uses magic, but her ability to use magic is something that's self-taught. She just learned over the years, much in the same way that Stephen Strange learned to use magic and became Doctor Strange. She's not nearly as powerful, but her mutant gene, whatever it happens to be, or at least whatever powers it happens to manifest, we don't really know what it is, right? And in fact, even in this moment when Hope Summers scans the entire biology of Mother Righteous, even that is just nebulous, right? Her response is she is a mutant. Her gift is really diffuse, like Legion's gift, but microscopic, many gifts, none of them solid. Maybe you have huge potential. Now, the reason why she uses Legion as an example here is that for those of you guys who are unfamiliar, Legion is arguably the most powerful mutant to ever exist in Marvel Comics. Not so much because of what he's able to do in and of himself, right? Somebody like Franklin Richards or Mad Jim Jaspers or Matthew Malloy, they have reality altering powers that we just see them perform. What makes Legion so incredibly powerful is that he's got thousands of personalities and each one has a power. Some of these powers are exactly the same. Other powers are different, but he has everything ranging from the ability to time travel, high levels of telepathy and telekinesis, personalities like the Origamist can bend reality. Moira X can actually alter reality, right? There's different versions of himself that can do different things. And it's just crazy how powerful he is. He just seemingly can't control it all, right? But the idea is that if he ever could control all those powers, he'd be a as close as anybody could ever get to becoming God. And so what ends up happening is Mother Righteous doesn't necessarily usurp the authority of Exodus. Instead, she does what she always does, which is kind of the slow creep of power. Now, before we get into that, jumping back to the island where these guys show up here with basically anti-psionics, right? So effectively, the ability to block out the telepathy of Xavier. The funny thing about this is Xavier's underestimated yet again. We don't exactly see what happens, right? Once he sees them, he's like anti-psionics very well. And where they go to open fire, all you see that happens next is they're literally just torn to pieces, decapitated, cut in half, their guts ripped out, all kinds of stuff. We don't exactly know what it was that did this because in the previous instance where we saw Xavier using his powers, he was using his telepathy to force these guys to see things that weren't actually there. But something that simply exists in your mind but does not exist in the tangible world could seemingly not really do any damage to you, right? It was just enough to scare them. Whatever's going on here, Marvel looks like they're moving in the direction of either Xavier's telepathy is on a whole new level, right? He's just unleashing in a way that we've never seen him do before, which is the most likely candidate, or they're giving him like telekinesis, right? They're giving him like some new powers or the ability to manifest monsters, whatever it is in the physical world. We don't fully know, but I am excited to find out. Having said that, and jumping back to Mother Righteous, once she meets with Exodus, she really just kind of presents to them this sort of utopia that looks very similar to the Savage Land, which is to say a jungle paradise in a place where a jungle paradise shouldn't exist. Nobody here really questions it because in a lot of ways they see it as a kind of salvation and so they're not really going to look a gift horse in the mouth. But understand, Mother Righteous is not doing this seemingly because it's just altruistic. She always has a bigger plan. There's always something that she's doing. This is why I say the slow move of power creep, because seemingly what she's doing here is kind of usurping the authority of Exodus. That where Exodus says, I will lead all of you to paradise. I will lead all of you to the place that we can call home and whatever this place happens to be until such a time as we can return to our actual home. The reality is Mother Righteous is the one that presents herself here. And she's the one that really shows them this place. Now, that's easy to dismiss. And you could say, well, I mean, Exodus led us to her and she's the one that led us to this, but like she's going to make a power move somewhere along the line. But in the midst of all of this, Exodus makes this statement where he says, be careful what you wish for. The testing has barely begun. The Logans are dogs, wild animals in the wasteland, but they are far from the greatest threat. Do not forget, the desert is also the home of Satan. And what it shows us is apocalypse. Seemingly, apocalypse is in this place. And he's going to test them over and over and over again. He's going to weed out and kill off the weakest mutants, leaving only the strongest to survive. I am very excited to see what happens because my main man is finally back. 
With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. If you guys need to get caught up on Fall of X, make sure you click this link to the playlist, and I will catch you all later. Peace.